Morant with a running start. Elevate! Oh, oh, it does! Oh, my goodness! Oh. A tie game in overtime. Gasol will turn his heat. It's good! And Gasol tap. Seven tenths remain. Only now a three. Count it! A 15 point play for Memphis. And Blake Griffin gets into it on the floor with Randolph. Hard to tell if there are any punches being thrown under there, but Griffin took exception. Adams going long. Morant! Oh, Welcome to Grits and Grinds, a Memphis Grizzlies podcast. Grizzlies win six straight edition. My name is Keith Parrish. I kind of thought on Monday night the Grizzlies schedule would start to toughen up. That was not the case whatsoever. The Atlanta Hawks coming off a dramatic overtime win against the Bulls on Sunday where seven points were scored in the final 2.1 seconds, decided to rest Trey Young and Bogdan Bogdanovich on the second night of a back-to-back. Also, Clint Capella was ruled out. DeJounte Murray is hurt. John Collins is hurt. So the Grizzlies faced a Hawks team that was missing maybe its five best players the very least five of its top six scores, and the Grizzlies did not have a letdown. It was not a trap game. The Grizzlies dominated the Hawks with a 25-point blowout win. Yes, the Grizzlies themselves were a little bit shorthanded. Ja Morant was out for this game. Steven Adams set out with the ankle injury that he suffered against the Pistons. On paper... This was a massive advantage game for the Grizzlies, but also it was one of those trap games. You're like, all right, we have this massive rest advantage. We have a big talent advantage. Are we susceptible to the trap game here? Maybe a little bit, but turns out no. I think it was possible, but if you look at it from my perspective and maybe a gambling perspective, I saw that with Steven Adams out, we're going to start Brandon Clark again. We're starting... A front court of Dylan Brooks, Jaron Jackson Jr., and Brandon Clark. We have Tyus Jones, a more than capable backup point guard, and got Conchar in there. You're telling me we get to start this against the Atlanta Hawks B team? I'm all in. Grizzlies were favored by 9.5. I was all in. And it turned out excellently. The Grizzlies got off to a super fast start, made their first nine field goal attempts, and then, of course, Jaron Jackson Jr., the block panther, as they call him. Had a career-high eight blocked shots. Ties a franchise record held by Pau Gasol, Mark Gasol, and Stromile Swift. But Jaron Jackson Jr. continued this awesome run. The Jaron Jackson Jr. stats are preposterous right now. Yeah, 15 points, eight blocks, and seven rebounds is clearly very, very nice. But what he's done in 11 games, the Grizzlies are 8-3 and three in those 11 games he's played. What he's done statistically in these 11 games, and just if you throw off that first game against the Pelicans, just the last 10 games, the man is averaging in his last 10 games 19.5 points per game and 3.5 and blocks per game. He's making 54.5% of his field goal attempts in the last 10. If you include the 3 for 14 first game of the year, he's still... Over 50% for the year. He was 41% on field goals last year. In just the last 10, he's at 41.7% on his three-point attempts. He's made over 50% of his field goal attempts in six straight games. That ties a mark that he set back in 2019. In Jaron's last 10 games, 19.5 points per game, three and a half blocks per game, 1.1 1.1 steals per game, two three-pointers per game, all of this while playing only 26 minutes. It's incredible. Here's a stat for you. Jaron Jackson Jr. is the first player in NBA history to have 150 points, 30 blocks, 23s, and 10 steals 
over a 10-game span. 150 points, 30 blocks, 23s, and 10 steals. Only player ever. The only guys to have 30 blocks, 23s, and 10 steals over a 10-game span, it's Jaron, Robert Covington, and Brooke Lopez. A slightly lesser stat. Actually, it's a much lesser stat. The only players with 20 blocks and 10 made threes over a five-game span, that is Jaron along with Brooke Lopez, Rafe LaFrance, and Miles Turner. It's not just that he's leading the NBA in blocks per game. It's that he's scoring 19.5 points per game in just 26 minutes. The offensive numbers are there. And this one, he was scoring in the paint, scoring off the dribble. That loping left-hand layup was giving him some success. Onyeka Nkongu does not want to play him again, I'm assuming. I mean, you saw the sequences. In the first quarter, he picked up four blocks in the first quarter, tied his career high for blocks in a quarter. But you saw the Hawks turning down field goal attempts in the paint to eventually just give up and drive at him and have their shot get blocked. He was affecting everything the Hawks did. One of the more dominant NBA defensive performances you will see. We talked about that block percentage. The career high or the record in the NBA for the highest block percentage in the season is owned by Minute Bull at a 10.6% block percentage. Block percentage is the percentage of your opponent's two-pointers you block when you're on the court. The updated block percentage for our guy, Jaron Jackson Jr., 12.6%. He's blocking one out of every eight opponent two-point attempts when he's on the court. Bizarro numbers. Unbelievable work from Jaron Jackson Jr. Also in this game, I mean, this game is the Jaron Jackson Jr. game. But you got to mention Tyus Jones starting for Ja Morant. Tyus Jones had 22 points and 11 assists. Picked up three steals. By the way, he pulled ahead of Ja Morant for 21st on the franchise leaderboard in steals. Ja Morant had passed him in the previous game, and then they ended up tied. I guess Tyus and Ja are going to be fighting for that steals mark, maybe for the rest of their careers. Uh, Advantage Ja with the playing time. Tyus Jones with another 20-point, 10-assist game. His third one of the season. Remember, he had zero 20-10 and 10 games before this season. I heard a lot of people grumbling about Tyus Jones' play earlier in the year. Tyus Jones was so good. Now, in the games he starts, he averages over 21 points and 8.4 assists and two steals. It's remarkable. Such a low usage guy, and he's become now like a fantasy stud when he gets the start. He's made 54% of his three-point attempts as a starter this year. Just two and three as a starter. The first three, kind of forgettable as far as the team performances, but these last two have been those classic blowouts. I mean, this was a classic blowout similar to last year. You remember last year, they had the most 25-point blowouts in the league. I believe it was the third most 25 point blowouts in league history for a team. And now with this win over the Hawks, it's their second 25-point blowout of the year. They had a season-high 36 assists. They shot 60% from the field as a team. It's the highest field goal percentage they've had this year. The only higher percentage from last year was the 73-point win over the Thunder, where they shot 62.5% from the field. They only allowed the Hawks to shoot 35.6% on their field goal attempts. They shot 25 percentage points better than their opponent. That is also absurd. By the way, I looked this up because that's who I am. They actually shot 24. what, 7% percentage points better than their opponent. That was the 134th instance in NBA history of a team having a field goal percentage 24 percentage points better than their opponent. Those teams are 134 and 0, which obviously makes sense. 
The Grizzlies are undefeated this season when amassing at least 30 assists, 5-0 and this season. Now 23-1 and over the last two seasons when getting at least 30 assists. The perfunctory updating of the stats, they are now 43-1 and over the last two seasons when they score at least 120 points. The team has three consecutive 30-assist games. Brandon Clark played well again, getting the start for Steven Adams. He made all five of his field goal attempts. Finished with 11 points, five rebounds, two assists, a steal, and a block. The team is now 12-2 and two this season when Brandon scores in double digits. Over the last two seasons, 46-7 and seven when Brandon Clark scores in double digits. During the Grizzlies' current six-game win streak, Brandon has made 36 of his 47 field goal attempts. That is 76.6%. That is the highest field goal percentage over any six-game span in Grizzlies franchise history. The minimum cutoff I used was 20 field goal attempts. If you lower it, down to 10 field goal attempts, which over a six-game span, 10 field goal attempts, that's pr- preposterous. But if you do, you find a Hashim the beat stretch where he made 11 of 14, 78%. Good job, Hashim. Brandon Clark has been cooking. The field goals are going in. The Grizzlies, yes, it's been a cakewalk of a schedule. The win over the Heat, the shorthanded win over the Heat, when we could argue we got them in a trap game, That's a good victory. The win over the Sixers, no Tyrese Maxey, no James Harden. That's still a good win. But a lot of these, kind of a cakewalk. You played the Hawks B team. You played the Thunder. I mean, the Thunder are competitive usually. They didn't have Lou Dort. But the Grizzlies are taking care of business. They're racking up those steals and blocks. Yeah, Jaron had eight. The team has put up a bunch of steals and blocks. They're now up to 12th on the season for steals per game. They were down in the 20s. They've posted six straight games of having at least eight steals. The stocks are coming back now that Jaron Jackson Jr. is here. The team made 13 three-pointers against the Hawks. The three-pointers are going in at a pretty solid rate. That's one thing where I can say I got that wrong. Because I did not anticipate them being able to maintain the three-pointers without Desmond Bain. For the season, they are averaging slightly more threes per game than they did last year. They're at 12 threes per game. Last year, they were 11 and a half. They're shooting slightly better, 36% on threes, up from 35.3%. All of that could just be a random aberration, a small sample size abnormality. But I think, personally, them doing that without Desmond Bain for... About half of these games, that's super impressive. Santi Aldama, really been helping out there. He made two more threes in this one, scored 16 points. Over Santi's last 15 games, he's making 41% of his three-pointers. Of course, this homestand has furthered the divide between his home and road splits. He's averaging 12.5 points per game at home, 7.5 on the road. The home shooting splits at home, he's 52, 39, 81. On the road, he's still 41, 31, 65. But this three-point volume, which you assume is going to stay up or improve, I mean, you would assume it would improve when Desmond Bain comes back. Very, very promising stuff. I mean, a lot of it's Jaron. Jaron's making 40% of his threes. I mean, look out, guys. This Grizzlies team uh, could be incredible. By the way, in the Desmond Bain games, when Desmond Bain plays, 9-3. and three. When Jaron Jackson Jr. plays, they're 8-3. and three. Quite obviously, they haven't played a game together yet. Dylan Brooks had kind of a weird game. He had 18 points on 11 field goal attempts, made five three-pointers. That is awesome. He had four assists. Love to see it. He was a team-best plus 35 when on the court. That a boy, Dylan. He had a career-high tying six turnovers, and they were all basically inexcusable. The team didn't take care of the basketball. It didn't really matter. The Grizzlies had 22 turnovers. 
Dylan's six, I thought were especially gross, but who cares? Team best plus 35. The Grizzlies got solid contributions from the entire starting lineup. I mean, no one in this game, this is another weird thing. Nobody in the game except for Zaire Williams shot under 50%. Every player who played except for Zaire Williams made over 50% or at least 50% of their field goal attempts. Sometimes there are good games and fun games and easy games, and this was one of them. John Conchar made four out of five, had seven rebounds and five assists to go with nine points. He was a toe on the line from winning me money. Uh, he only made that one three-pointer. I thought it was two uh, toe on the line. It was a long two-pointer. One thing that Conchar, I feel like, has really improved on recently, and I might just be noticing this more, but he seems to have added an attack and score off the dribble element to his game. Not like a one-on-one -on -one move beat your defender thing, but when the ball swings to him, he is surprising his defender, I feel like, and attacking and driving quickly right to the basket. He's made a lot of these left-handed layups doing this in the past couple of games. I feel like I've specifically seen that a lot. I don't know if it's supported by data that it's actually increased, but it feels like, you know, we knew he's a spot-up shooter, low-usage spot-up shooter, but he's adding a dribble element where he catches it and attacks quickly if he feels like there's a scene for him to get to the bucket, and it's resulted in a bunch of layups for Conchar. So that's been really great to see. Kennedy Chandler finished with a nice stat line. Eight points, seven assists, career high, obviously, and six rebounds. Also got a block and a steal. A spectacular block on Aaron Holiday on a fast break. Of course, full context, Aaron Holiday got him back right after that. Uh, Aaron picked his pocket and then got a breakaway layup. Kennedy Chandler did have four turnovers, but you saw a very strong game from Kennedy Chandler leading the second unit. David Roddy with 11 points and a few very strong David the Body Roddy finishes, going right through his defender uh, to finish. The only, again, the only maybe negative outside of the team turnovers is uh, Zaire Williams, who had a rough game, was one for seven, missed all four of his three-pointers, had four points, three rebounds, two assists, and three turnovers. Also got a steal and a block. The only thing that I thought was quizzical about this game, if you want to dig deeper, and not just sit back and, and coast on the cool stats of Jaron Jackson Jr. blocking all these shots and uh, Brandon Clark making all of his field goal attempts and Tyus Jones having these awesome numbers. I thought it was weird how little Zaire Williams played. I thought that was I thought it was notable. Uh, we're just the third game in. Okay, you know, it's third game back. But this was a game where three of your starters are not playing. No Ja, no Desmond, no Steven Adams. Zaire was the 10th guy to check in. The Grizzlies were rocking a uh, Kennedy Chandler, David Roddy, Dylan Brooks, Santi Alzama, Xavier Tillman, five-man unit. That's four out of five summer leaguers on the court. They were doing that in the first quarter before Zaire Williams even checks in. I do not like that lineup one bit. doesn't inspire a ton of faith in me. So Zaire checks in at the start of the second quarter. He plays six minutes, and that's it. So three starters down, Zaire Williams played only six minutes in the first half. Just thought that was strange. I think a lot of us were hoping for and anticipating a Zaire Williams second-year leap. It still obviously could come. We're just three games in. Three games in, you win in a big blowout. But I did find it curious I think almost everyone, if you saw who was out and you saw who was available for the Grizzlies outside of the context of how the season has gone, you would think that Zaire would have a big role. You'd argue that, oh, well, they'll start Zaire. Well, we know they're not going to because Conchar's been so good as a starter this year. It's all right. Well, they're not going to start, but, you know, Zaire's going to anchor that second unit. Well, they're depending more on David Roddy. Again, it's probably just him being brought along slowly. They want to make sure. I'm guessing there's no reoccurrence of this knee tendinitis or the knee pain he's been suffering. 
And we're not super worried about the shooting numbers because he hasn't gotten a lot of minutes. He's only played in three games this year. But I thought it was interesting to only play six minutes in the first half when you're missing three starters. So that would basically put him 13th on the depth chart uh, when fully healthy. I uh, thought it was kind of weird. But we'll continue to monitor that. I assume his minutes will keep ticking up and we'll start getting a lot of those uh, Zaire Williams highlights coming in fast and furious. I mean, we've already gotten a couple lobs already this season with him. Just the uh, the jumper hasn't fallen yet. Uh, end of the game, Jake LaRavia got back in. He missed the last few games. Didn't statistically make his mark, but Kenneth Lofton Jr., uh, the human victory cigar, comes in, makes both of his buckets, picks up an assist. Uh, he's a walking bucket. The word has been from John Roser over on the Chris Vernon show that maybe he hasn't put in the best effort in the Memphis Hustle games. He compiles a lot of statistics, but the effort for defense and rebounding and conditioning maybe a little bit lacking. So those of us who really enjoy Kenneth Lofton Jr. and continue to wonder, like, how many guys have to be out for him to play? Uh, maybe one of the reasons is he's not progressing maybe as well as they hoped as far as the uh, outside of the scoring elements of his game. Anyways, six straight wins is awesome. Taking care of business at home. They've won four straight on this homestand. They've beaten the people they're supposed to beat. They've moved within a half game of the Pelicans in the Western Conference. You're 18 and 9. But now, truly, guys, I'm not just uh, trying to sound alarmist. Now, the schedule does actually get tough, okay? I mean, maybe the Bucks will rest everyone on Thursday night. But the Grizzlies have two days off and then wrap up the homestand against the Milwaukee Bucks on Thursday. That should be a tough game. And then you embark on the road trip. You play at the Thunder before road games against the Nuggets, the Suns, and the Warriors. Then you come back home and face the Suns again. Seven of the Grizzlies' next eight opponents are playoff teams from last year. You got the Bucks, the Nuggets, the Suns twice, the Warriors, the Raptors, the Pelicans. Those are all pretty tough games. Again, I keep saying that. Surely some of these games will be tough. <laughs> Surely some of these teams will suit up their best players. So far this year, with the win over the Hawks, the Grizzlies are now 6-7 and seven against playoff teams from last year, so... The tough sledding starts now, we think, but with the way Jaron Jackson Jr. is playing, I mean, absolutely all-star level, absolutely defensive player of the year level. John Schumann had a stat on NBA.com that right now, when Jaron is on the court, opponents are shooting 10% worse on their field goal attempts, which is the largest disparity or the largest difference for any player in the NBA. Add that to the DPOY argument for Jaron. Leads the league in blocks. Has a historic block percentage through 11 games. Opponents are not making their field goals when he's on the court. And the Grizzlies defense has been transformed. Great win for the Grizz. Great season so far. Um, will it get harder? Who knows? Um, but... It looks like uh, we're going to have some fun games coming up as the Grizzlies can test themselves. And hopefully one of these days, maybe as a, my New Year's resolution is the Grizzlies be fully healthy and we play Ja and Desmond and Jaron all at the same time. Anyways, please subscribe to the Grits and Grinds YouTube channel. I blew right through the ad break, so let me tell you about the Grizzlies Winter Break Youth Basketball Camps. You can give the gift of basketball with Grizzlies Holiday Youth Basketball Camps presented by Nike. They're for children ages 6 to 13. You can sign up for one of the two-day sessions over the winter break hosted in Cordova and Jackson, Tennessee. The camps are $125 and include basketball skills training, a t-shirt, and two tickets to the January 8th game against the Jazz. Space is limited for these youth basketball camps, so sign up today at MimGrizYouth.com. All right, hope you guys have a great Tuesday. Talk to you soon. Go Grizz! Go Grizz!